Hey up and welcome to the Temple of Bleh. This is a conversation with a man whose very name is etched into the walls of the Temple of Blair. It's a man whose name has come up in many, many conversations about Roadrunner Records, and that man's name is Mark Abramson. Mark had two stints with Roadrunner Records, which total a, uh, a sentence of 22 years, if you want to see it that way. His role at the label concentrated on radio promotions. As such, he was very much in the trenches when it came to pushing the artists from the Roadrunner offices into your lovely ears. This is a very, very cool conversation, and Mark and I are very prone to jumping down rabbit holes and going all over the shop in terms of the chrono. Technology. And that's fine, and there's a special club for people like that, and it's called the Roadrunner Ramblers. Mike Gitt is an honorary member, as is Mark. As such, this is part one of Infinity. You're going to enjoy this one. One, two, fuck shit up. And an aggregate across them all. And all roads led to you. Everything I was t- <laughs> trying to figure out, like especially around the type of negative um, campaigns, like the Bloody Kisses campaign, things like that, things that I regard as really important to Roadrunner because the big thing is Roadrunner was a vehicle for such important things in metal, and we're only coming to realize that now in like the in the wake of its its independent absence, right? So. Everything, as I say, kind of, I'm just trying to plug a lot of knowledge gaps here. So you'll have to bear with me on my ignorance. But one of the things I saw you on as well was a Cannibal Corpse documentary. <laughs> yes. I think it was like the first 20 years. And at that point, you referred to it as Mark Psycho Abramson. And yes. I'd like to ask you how that came about. And I know I don't think you use the term now. You know, I've got a, uh, a phrase now, which is, if you knew me then, you're still allowed. <laughs> um, but yeah, it, there there was a point where uh, I kind of transitioned into a more professional uh, <laughs> thing. It was it was my own evolution. You know, you, you know, look, there's there are there are so many similarities. You know, and, and yeah, uh, I'm a promo guy, so I'm going to lean into some of this stuff. But similarities to me and uh, and Roadrunner, you know, as we both evolved, um, the the psycho thing, yeah, it, it started off, you know, and and it also leads to to me getting to Roadrunner in a lot of ways. You know, my awesome. uh, my story was a a strong instinctive drive uh, of just an out of control metalhead. Um, you know, I went off to college in Buffalo, New York. Um, my, my original plan was to become a DJ. Um, I got my, uh, college FCC license literally over orientation weekend. And, um, and then I found there was a metal show on the radio station and I immediately through, because I was a, brash out of control kid i i made i got myself to become the third man on a two-man team um <laughs> and it was a very hair metal kind of show um which is not my thing but mm-hmm. i was a metal guy and i wanted on the radio uh it's funny the the start of the name was something as unexciting as i needed a radio name and i wanted something <laughs> metal um <laughs> It, it was something inside, though, that kind of opened up where I then kind of felt like I had to live up to it. But also I was let loose. You know, it was right. so now I was away from home um, and I became friend. I started immediately started becoming friends with all the local bands, um, including amongst many local bands, uh, a band up there called Beyond Death, um, which featured a bass player named Alex Webster. Um, it's a little bit more famous for a different band nowadays. Um, Alex and I became really good friends. Uh, we actually, and, and where the documentary, you know, where I, it's, I mean, yes, I was a big part of the beginning of the Cannibal Corpse story. Uh, I mean, Alex and I, along with our friend Joe, uh, we were roommates in this apartment on Grant Street. Uh, as Alex so beautifully dubbed it, it was the death metal animal house. Uh, I mean, what happened was it was you had Alex from the local band and Psycho from the local metal radio show. And we were, we literally um, did, did not give two craps. Um, and so every weekend we would have the metal community just converge on our slum apartment um, and just trash it. 
it was out of control and and so it, it's you know my, my stories there's so many just stupid drunken stories that you know that it was just me being trying to live up to a reputation that i created myself um now what i realized you know and how we get to the whole roadrunner thing uh that was awesome but i also being an i first of all can i curse on this thing Absolutely. <laughs> you can you can eat right, so I, in the c word i just bleep it out Ah, so you're right. You're a Brit. <laughs> um, so basically, is as I was an idealistic little shit. Um, basically, I realized, and this was a big problem for the idealistic little shit that I was, is that I realized that when I became a DJ, I wasn't going to have full control, full autonomy over what I played, like I did on my metal show. Well, this was a problem. I didn't want to play what someone else was going to tell me to play. Sure. Um, I was going to have to play some crap. This mattered. Um, <laughs> but what it is is so I then realized, I said, huh, as I'm sitting there and I was getting called all the time by these, uh, this is back in, you know, as the, as the industry was so much healthier then, they had promo people calling the metal radio shows, which is something you don't really have much now, sure. not from the labels. Um so I'm getting calls from all these labels, and I start thinking, "Huh, I should do a, I should go to the label side of things." Um, and again, I was laser focused. You know, Alex and I really fueled each other on the underground metal scene. Alex was about as plugged in as a as a guy could be. I mean, he was turning me on to all this stuff. I mean, it was like you know, I you know, I mean, I actually had every single earache release ever released wow. up until a point you know i mean it was like so we were i remember when altars of madness came out and we uh i talked to the local record store who i was plugged in with to get me getting me an import copy stuff like that the point is is that i decided there was only two labels i wanted to work for so not only was i going to go into the, uh, the business but it had to be again i was so much of this was a drive and it was like it was so focused and I didn't, there was no widespread net. There's two labels I wanted to work for, Roadrunner or Eric. Now, Eric didn't have a US base, so Roadrunner. So um, what year are we in now? Uh, this would have been, I think it would be about 90. So Eric's already established, it's Eric's four years in, Digby's thrown out grindcore to the masses. Maybe a few thrash. I think Carcass are on there as well. Roadrunners yep, yep. got momentum now on the thrash and death element of stuff. This is sort of where that's that's the scene you're facing into at the minute. What's Metalblade doing at this point? Well, uh, obviously, around that time, they were getting ready to sign Cannibal Corpse. Um, sure. And so it was, you know, obviously. Look, I mean, Metal Blade. You know, you could easily say, well, dude, why weren't you considering Metal Blade? Mm. I don't know, because that's where my love was. <laughs> you know, I love the Roadrunner stuff, you know, and I love the label. And look, there's I always said, you know, it's funny. You laugh to the mug. Bleed Roadrunner red. You know, it, it, there's, there's a thing about Roadrunner and it, it, it only grew over the years. There was something about it. Um, and so. Let's unpack Maybe. that then, because that's what this that's what this whole thing is about. Because yeah. people aren't yeah. realizing this yet. Because I'm shilling for a company for no reason. And we need to give it a reason, <laughs> otherwise I'm a fucking fool. It I, I, okay, let's let's how did you uh, what for me, right? The re, the the point I realized that Roadrunner was like a, a weird entity was 15 years after this story. It was in 2005. I picked up God forbid's um, constitution of treason and looked on the back yeah. and realized that it wasn't a Roadrunner CD. And I was like, that's century media. And I was like, all oh, right. <laughs> I thought because being like a 15, 16 year old, I was like, right, well this little red thing seems to be associated with this kind of, of sound, what we then referred to as metal core. And then it yeah. was like, all oh, right, this is by design. This is this is like there's a thing going on here. So for yourself, take taking back going back into like 15, 20 years, at what point did you realize that Roadrunner is an entity, it's a force to be reckoned with, and then it slotted itself into your ambition and drive? You know, it's funny because most of the really critical stuff did have look, I mean, there's no question. I am so 
amazingly excited to be a part of the phase that I was in. Um, you know, it was like, I mean, I, I did get the golden era and, and I got to be a, a big part of that for sure. You know, it's so it, it's funny. It's like when you look back, the thing that made this that red logo, the thing that basically if you saw that on a record, you bought it. Um, so much of that actually did happen even after I'd gotten there. So it was some kind of I mean, yeah, you had King Diamond, you had Annihilator. Um, and again, it's, you know, as we're sitting here talking about all the extreme stuff, um, you know, it's, okay, not to get a little bit too, yeah, you want this anyway, and this is fine, but it's all part of the big thing. I try to explain to these youngins nowadays <laughs> that it's like, you can only open the door once, meaning that now everything all this extremity is out there and that doesn't mean that there aren't great exciting bands uh you know breaking new ground there there are there's i mean always but you know when you look back and i sit there and bring up things like king diamond and annihilator and stuff like that it's like that was metal then um i remember as we were saying i remember when things like morbid angel came out uh, or napalm death and as old bands as they are now it's like that shit was mind-blowing it was like that was the first time bands did stuff like that mm -hmm. so right so you look back in the great bands i mean annihilator king diamond stuff like that which were some of the earliest stuff carnivore um you know these are some of the earlier bands that roadrunner was putting out that was great metal um and it, look, it, I don't think it hurt that I had a great relationship with the uh, promo person, the girl who was calling me, who's still one of my best friends to this day. Uh, she was the one calling me. And so, so you know, all this stuff binds together. And, you know, just to, to kind of finish up the story of how I got there, just, you know, to kind of – is, and, and then it leans into it because um, it all flows together. You know, I it's funny just because I, I love telling you. It's a little self-serving, but I love it. Um, you know, I decided that I wanted to work at Roadrunner, so I called her up and said, I want a job. Give me a job. Well, there are no jobs, kid. <laughs> I'm like, okay, well, I'll be your intern. Let me be your intern. You take interns? She's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You got to, you know, you got to come in. You got to meet with the, the boss, you know. But yeah, yeah, we do interns. Uh, and I grew up on Long Island. She grew, she was living on Long Island. Um, so it was like, it was all local stuff. And uh, but I went in I, I, to met, meet with Doug Keo, uh, a name I'm sure you've heard. Yes. And I sat with him and I went, uh, I'm here for the job. And he looked at me, hey, kid, what, what job? You're not here for a job. And I one of the cockiest things I've done in my uh, number of years on this planet is I looked at this guy and I said, the job you're going to give me after you give me this internship and I prove that you need me. <laughs> looks at me, laughs, he goes, okay, kid, you can be the intern. <laughs> you got it. You got the internship. Um, but I was right. Uh, I, because I, I put, as I was, I put all the chips in center of the table. I said, I'm going to make Roadrunner work. Um, wow. and, I, and I didn't leave for many years. Um, was the, it was, was the girl who called you yeah, yeah. Kathy? Kathy, yes. Excellent. Kathy's, uh, it was the person, and and she and I drove in uh, from Long Island together because, you know, again, we didn't live too far from each other, so we commuted every day, um, you know, and, you know, there were, she was much more of a accessible metal person, so she would lean into, because I, I worked for her for in the beginning, uh, so she would love uh, like, like her big thing was, you know, last crack was her big thing. Uh, she also, however, wouldn't touch exhorter with a 10 foot pole. And I still, to this day, will say that those two records are two of the greatest records that Roadrunner has ever released. Um, I was like, slaughter the Vatican, sign me up. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we, we complimented each other really well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Um, I was just a diversion. Yeah, no, 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 no. All good. It's, uh, so, so the, the brand, it evolved, you know, I mean, and of course, you know, look, Monty is, is famous <laughs> or infamous uh, or legendary, uh, but there's a reason for that, you know, there was, and it's funny because 
there was all this other stuff happening at Roadrunner, but the stuff that put us on the map, because when you look back, I mean, it, it, it's funny, and I know some of the stuff we'll get into, you know, is some of the other tastes and flavors of Roadrunner. They were always happening, but Monty tapped into some of this pivotal stuff. When you look at, for example, that crazy band from Brazil, um, Sepultura, yep. it's like it, 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 you want to talk about putting us on the map. You know, mm-hmm. and, and that started it because, as you know, success breeds success. And once you start getting some of the great metal bands, um, then more metal bands want to be a part of it. And then it, it's so you get access to this. And then it, people want it. I, I think it's interesting the the Monty's contribution because, of course, of course, because of course it fucking is. But it, it's <laughs> it's not so much the hard work that Monty did at the label, right? This is my sort of weird theory, which I'm sure he'll send me a season to assist on it or something um but for me it's like the the interesting part of monty's career isn't 87 onwards it's it's like 82 up to 87 this is the thing that engages me it's the three musketeers him borovoy and don k and it's the networking within that which i'm sure you must have been part of as part of the radio with the was it a college radio or was it just radio it, well, well, at the time, okay, when I got there, there was only college radio. Um, mm-hmm. You know, the commercial radio department uh, started later uh, when Case had me start it. Um, right. And, and again, idealistic little shit. He told me to go do this, and initially I said no. <laughs> <laughs> but that's... <laughs> Yeah, yeah. That's the luckily, um, luckily he looked at me and he and he basically didn't accept it and he said, "No, you're meant for bigger, better stuff than this." And it was so it wasn't like I missed an opportunity. He basically <laughs> said, "Shut up, kid. You're going to do this." <laughs> well, that's that's the case of leadership style. The way he probably just tapped in and went, "This guy's idealistic. Tell him what he wants to hear. You're destined for bigger things." And you were. He would say now, uh, at. 52 years old, he still wants me to be psycho. He still wants me to be that kid. He loved that. Um, and there's a good reason for that. It was drive. It was energy. It was passion. Um, I was ready to go through brick walls for my bands. Yeah. So, and he and that's, that. a blue, that's a blueprint of the label itself, really. I mean, this is the kind of the – I'm going all over the place, and, and that's cool because long form um, – Sometimes I think the reputation Roadrunner has, I think, on the surface level is there's some uh, dissenting viewpoints, usually from artists saying, you know, that the deal wasn't too favorable, that there was certain things on the business side which didn't stack up for us. And I think what people tend to miss, and hopefully this is what I'm going to try and penetrate is, what people tend to miss is there's an entire operation behind the scenes which is operating not to make money, but take it a step further, to make more metal. That's what the Roadrunner buildings were inhabited with. It wasn't a, there were charts and there were profit and loss sheets and things like that. But the end game for everyone in those rooms around those tables at their desk is to make more metal. And that's the whole idea. And I think Case understood that as well, which is why we have psychos and it's why we have um, uh, people like Monty and, and, and Doug. People just fucking loved it. People loved the music. You know, it's interesting to, to, to address that. It's funny because. Yes, I listened for years to bands bitch about the bad deals. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, as you and I, before we started this, I told you, I said, I don't, there, there isn't any real negatives. Well, listen, here's the thing. I guarantee you that there are many bands that would disagree with me um, because they sign bad deals. Well, welcome to the music business. And I don't mean to sound callous, but my point is, is, that was like the the model of the music business as a whole. So mm-hmm. it's not like Case was out there raping or ripping people off. He was doing business as business existed. Um, now, and it's funny, and, and Case is a businessman. Yep. Case is not the guy who bleeds metal. Um, and that's okay. What he did was – because Case wanted success all along. I don't say that as an apology to him. I say that as praise to him. He was a business owner who wanted a successful business. 
Yeah. Now, he's a music guy. His personal musical tastes are different. But what he did, though, was he he tapped in and he supported. And, and there are many business leaders that would say that their vision is the way it has to be. And they'll try and 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 shave the square peg so that it forces into the round hole. Mm -hmm. Whereas instead, I think what Case's uh, genius was is he, he did tap into this and he leaned into it. And yes, he was always trying to get other stuff to work as well, but he, he saw that this was happening. He leaned into it and he surrounded or he built his company up with a passionate team because as I sit there and say, I bled Roadrunner Red, well, let me also make it very clear. You're right. The, it was a family. And this isn't like I was the one who bled Roadrunner Red. I did, but every person in that room did. Every person there Mm -hmm. was this was had this their version of 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 me meaning like they were the same their personality of bleeding roadrunner red um yeah. and we all we were like oh my god this is the greatest thing ever yeah yeah i mean it's and we'll cut we'll get we'll come into that in, in a lot more detail i mean the example which i float around in terms of like you mentioned it was the it's a business it is a business first and foremost and when we talk about those deals I mean, I, I did some maths in my head, right? And I was like, 83 to 84. Discounting the license, the licensing arrangements that Case had with everyone around the world, you've got about 15 albums, majority of which I believe are original signings. So no licensing deal, but you are dealing with the arts development and uh, some of the core foundational costs for production and things like that. Let's, let's assume it's a $5,000 deal each time. $5,000 deal, 15 bands, that's $75,000 out the door, and it's a complete gamble. If you think about the cash flow situation and just the volume of it, it's no surprise that that's how the business operate because you've got, it's entirely, you have no idea if it's going to come back, if it's going to be a, a worthwhile investment. So you, even if your band, yeah, you signed the $5,000 deal and it didn't work out, yeah, okay, take your experience and times it by 15, 20, 25 as you move further through the road in years. And understand that's the gravity of the gamble that Case was making on an annual basis. And you got people like Doug doing the PL forms going, fucking hell, it's quarter one, and we need to be at this point by quarter three, otherwise we're in big trouble, I assume. Yeah, it, it's and you have to think think about the genre that we're talking about here. Yeah. Where, you know, okay, it's the the, there is only, I mean, what, only one band that really just knocked it out of the ballpark on their first record? Uh, Slipknot? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's it. Because yep. it's, and, and I'm not saying that that was, it, it took a lot of work and, and, and all that stuff, but Sepultura, for example, who for the longest time were the the pivotal you know benchmark the fashion. Fashion. it's like morbid vision schizophrenia beneath the remains it's like these are it's like they didn't start to really kick in really until album four now that was the old business model of artist development so you, it's right that's why the long-term deals that's why look i mean because you were investing it is a long-term gamble um you know, and it is what it is. I mean, obviously, as, a, as I know, one of the biggest places you want to go, I mean, one of the most important deals uh, in the history of Roadrunner, of course, came from, you know, an artist signing his life away. Uh, um, as if he was still with us, he would tell you, as he did. So none of this is a secret. I mean, the reason we have Typo is because of Carnivore, which is because Peter was still under contract. Yes. Um, you know, Roadrunner had Peter. Um, and so you can sit there and say, now, I'd say it all worked out well. And yes, they're, they're fr dear friends of mine, and I listened to them bitch for years about the bad deal. I'm sure there were aspects of the deal that were not good. I'm sure. I ain't the lawyer. Um, I wasn't the manager until now, <laughs> when, it <doesn't, laughs> it, it, when it's a moot point. Um, so I get it. Um, yeah. It is what it is. I guess my point about all this stuff is there's there's a veil which needs to be lifted for us to understand this properly and give it its proper due. 
And I think that's what the job is. And more importantly, putting us back into the chronology, it was a bit Wild Westy. So it's really compelling to me that when you walk out one day and go, I'm going to get a job at either Earache, I'm going to move to Nottingham, I'm going to move into a fucking <laughs> um, a red brick 60s flat, or I'm going to go down the road and go to Roadrunner. And it, that to me is, and again, it's about that drive, and that's another conversation entirely. Mm-hmm. I, it's, it's something it's something industry specific, I think, that, that draws that out of people. But you've walked in, you've told Doug what's up, and you start the <laughs> internship. So what's yeah. what's what's happening? Uh, have you, this isn't done through case. This is done through Doug and his capacity as as manager of the uh, that office. I C- correct. Right. Yes. Okay. Uh, Doug was running it, and you know there's there's nothing about the hiring of the intern that needed to be on Case's radar whatsoever. Uh, Free labor. So I didn't meet him until you know after the fact. You know, sure. It's just fine. It's you know layers. <laughs> <laughs> so when do you so tell talk me through experience as an intern all the way through to getting the real job and then the, the, it, was there a different perspective once you were walking in as a paid employee or was it just part of the family by that point did the duties change well you know when i started it was right i was calling metal radio stations um and that was this amazing realization where it was like wait, I can call up metalheads and talk about metal for a living? I'm like, (laughs) how did this happen in life? Um, But yeah, so it started off simply as, you know, she would give me, and I would start off with the smaller stations and the heavier stations, the more extreme stations. You know, that was her going here. You talk that language, you go talk to them. Um, And so, And that's what I did until she eventually moved on into another job because she Mm -hmm. got a great opportunity at another label, Um, at which point then. So the whole thing was a little bit of an evolution because I then went from unpaid intern to part-time employee somewhere along the way. Um, And then they actually uh, also hired, uh, well, a guy who wound up becoming uh, one of my best friends later in life, my best man at my wedding. But he was brought in uh, as the guy, and he actually gave him the more commercial, bigger stations. Uh, Again, he was kind of, he was from North Carolina. My my friend's name Steve Prue, uh, um, and he was there for a little while. Uh, Mm -hmm. Again, fresh little hothead. I was, at first, I was, I resented him because, you know, God damn it, that's, you know, I was goal-oriented. I wanted that job, and so it was... And then it evolved. And eventually the, he wound up being let go and I was given the whole thing. Mm-hmm. And then there were people that were, that were then put below me. Um, and so it was really just uh, this slow slog march towards growth. You know, it was yeah. like, so the, the, it, it just grew and it just evolved. And I just, so the, the duties just kept on building you know, steadily. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it never all of a sudden until the big thing was is when Case uh, and Doug and I went out to lunch one day. This is uh, years in where and they said we need someone to start calling these you know commercial radio stations and you know for regular airplay and you're going to be it um, or we think you should be it and I was like <laughs> I don't want to do that. <laughs> um, and at which point they said and Case said something along the lines of you could be one of the greatest promotion people ever you're meant for more than this you you, you got to do this mm-hmm. um at which point i was like okay um but obviously it changed you know look it's a, it's a little dramatic but yeah i mean the, what happened changed the course of not only my life but it did change the course of the label um mm-hmm. because our biggest i'll do a little this is look it, it is what it is I don't believe that the biggest radio story that put us on the map would have happened if it wasn't for me because of what typo meant to me and what I did. I don't think that another person would have been as, as determined because it was not an easy task. And I don't think that I that 
having lived the life I've lived and worked in the peers of, of commercial radio promotions people, mm-hmm. I don't know with, a, with the kind of band they are that anyone else would have not given up um, mm-hmm. because it was unheard of what we were doing. Um, okay. And people thought I was out of my fucking mind for even suggesting that they play this thing. And I think at some point, most people would have said, it's just not going to work. So okay. it changed everything. Let's let's jump into Bloody. I want to talk a little bit about how the label expanded from sort of Thrash and Death, but I think you were moving quite swiftly into the Bloody Kisses campaign. I it, 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 just not to just to kind of to touch on that just a second, and we will mm-hmm. look. Bloody Kisses is so much a part of of my story. We'll jump back into that. Oh, yeah. I think the key thing that people do need to remember, though, is it's yeah, there were always other things happening there was an yes. em, there was an alternative uh brand from the beginning with emergo with gangrene and all this stuff there was always all this other stuff that was happening mm-hmm. and so that's and that goes back to case always trying to find the stuff that works but but yeah so it's kind of go where you want to go let's go <laughs> yeah, yeah no, it's it, it the law a lot of compelling phrases you use there it's like the, i remember reading a lot of the trades this is probably a, a good this is probably why fucking the, the the psycho angle really played because usually i i will check like the billboard trades all the stuff that is recorded and online and things like that you are all fucking over the trades this is how i found um uh sydney maxwell and this is how obviously we got in touch regarding that fear factory um image um there was one article which is i think it's like wine and music there was been like you were trying to pair music with particular brands of rating records and wine july the 5th 2002 with sydney maxwell (laughs) you're all over the fucking shop and there is one article where it's talking about I, I, i can't remember the exact um theme of the article but it was something to do with like the effect of the promotional game and, and how it's changed over the years and there was two chaps that were talking about yourself and how typo was just not going to play it's just not happening whatsoever until you can beat him over the head with a bat and eventually they grew to love it but i'll tell you what my experience and my knowledge is of this particular thing uh the bloody kisses campaign is because you are the authority on this as far as I'm concerned. However, I did speak to Jim Salaby and the thing I find so compelling about it are two things. One, it was always Case's mission to get a platinum record in the US, platinum single, platinum record, blah, 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 blah. In pursuit of that goal, he sat Jim down and said, okay, you're my head of sales. I want a gold record. Now is the time. It was as simple as that. And it took Jim, Doug, a few other people, perhaps yourself, to sit down and look at the roster and go, what's the most viable gold record in this? Typo. Off we trot, boys. And there we go. Is that about right? The design of it is staggeringly, it's so compelling to me. You know, it's, you know, Typo was, was always something it was interesting because you know obviously as you know okay so we had him with carnivore uh hardcore band um and then you know uh we got the repulsion demo um which as we all know really is slow deep and hard um and that you know and that was staggeringly brilliant if you ask me uh you know one of the one of the best things that the labels ever put out that I'll wax poetic on that. Um, and then, of course, uh, there was the origin of the feces. But no one really saw coming what came. Um, you know, and that was really Peter, you know, leaning into, as we all know, where he really wanted to go. Um, he didn't want to be carnivore per se he's much more of a goth oriented guy um you know and it was like it's funny i went back to kind of look to kind of try as i told you to kind of get a grasp on on the time frame on on certain things and you know it's it was interesting because there was actually the other one that was around that time there was a couple things that you know and it's funny to kind of you know put it all in a time frame. Um, 
there were a few things in 92 that could have been it. Uh, and so there were a few things that we tried. It wasn't actually just this. I mean, yes, there was absolutely, uh, at the time that the decision was made, it was a, we're going to break this record, period. Um, mm -hmm. Or is it exclamation point? But when you look back to 92, you know, you had a couple things. There was the grunt truck record. Yeah. Um, which was us trying to kind of tap into, and this was one of the first things I did at commercial radio as well. Um, and that was us trying to tap into the Seattle thing. It was a great, great record. Um, I just yeah. love the fact that I got to work with Tommy Accused, but, but I digress. Uh, um, and so, and we weren't ready for that, you know, as a label. I, I, I've looked back and I go, you know, I don't think we were, and the band was all, you know, Ben used to always bitch about it as all of his friends, you know, exploded into multi-platinum status, you know, because the, the Seattle scene. Um, but that just, it, it, it opened some doors for us, but that wasn't the one. Um, there is, of course, uh, what I consider to be one of the black marks on the label, uh, which is Star Star. <laughs> um, but that could have been it, according to some people. Renamed themselves recently. Um, I, I, good. I'm glad to hear that they're still doing what they're doing. All good. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the typo thing, like I said, the reason why I, I take so much of the statement I, uh, and the stance I said is I, from the moment I got the repulsion demo, typo changed my personal life. You know, it tapped into me like it did so many other people, but it was one of the most important things for me at that point in my life. Uh, it, it connected with me on, on a level beyond. Um, this is before I was friends with the guys. This is, mm -hmm. and we became friends rather quickly, but it was such an important record to me. So when it came down to it, the Bloody Kisses, of course, I don't think anyone needs to be sold on the fact of how brilliant that album is. Um, we heard that and it was like, okay, this is, this is it. And so this was, I was going to get this thing on the air and I refused to hear otherwise now there is so much of the life with the landscape was different then also is this was at a time when uh radio stations still took phone calls um something unheard of now to a large degree pretty much you know almost you know i mean there are some stations that may hear this thing and take exception with that but for the most part no one's taking live phone calls anymore mm -hmm. the point of that is you could get what was known as a reaction record where you could put something on the air and the phones could explode and so this was at a point where it was like if they were not and most people were like i'm not playing this it was black number one um which we worked twice mm -hmm. um the point is we started off with black number one and it was like they were, I'm not going to play this thing. I'm like, just test it. Just test it. Just throw it on the air. You don't have to commit to it. And so we'd get a few test spins. And again, people, phones would melt down. Phones would explode. Uh -huh. um, and, you know, and it was wild. You know, I was like, like to, to tell people, there was myself and a good friend of mine over at Epic were in the process of, uh, I was doing this while she was working this crazy band out of Bakersfield, California called Corn. Um, wow. <laughs> obviously, they eclipsed us quite a bit, um, but that's okay. But it was like, so we, the two projects were, I believe, really single-handedly pushing the envelope for commercial radio in the heavy aspect. Um, and so, and we did this for two years. Um, we worked bl uh, Black Number One, we worked Christian Woman, mm -hmm. and then I went back and did another round of Black Number One to go get some of the people that refused to play it the first time around. Um, so it was really, it wasn't, it was more about, it was about building an artist. Uh, mm -hmm. It wasn't about getting a number one radio song because that wasn't the kind of campaign it was. Uh, it was too long, too drawn out. But every single station that added it snowballed this thing, and mm -hmm. it got bigger and bigger and bigger. Now, a big part of this also was that there were certain artists, and again, some of this stuff is well known, who who also – I mean, look, it, this is 
I'm not sitting here single-handedly saying that I broke the ban. I know my place in the story, but you could easily look at things like uh, the run of dates with Nine Inch Nails, um, which even though it was only about a week or so, was amazing and had them play in some pivotal markets like L.A. Uh, And then there's no overstating the importance of the Motley Crue tour. And that came from Motley Crue. Uh, They wanted the band – um and that's i mean and so and again and that started a string of amazing touring opportunities so mm-hmm. the whole thing one feeds into another into another into another into another and next thing you know we have the first gold mm-hmm. record for roadrunner it's the radio stuff's really interesting because a lot of the times when i'm speaking to to people such as yourself it's it's there's always a, a sort of an introductory statement of back then but the thing is now it's the engagement economy, like and subscribe, do this, do that, click this link, affiliate link. It's always been that. It's always been if you're if you can indicate that you're getting the, the engagement and people are spending time on your platform, then you are winning. And it was the same back then, and it's the same now. Always has been. It's just the tooling's different. But the thing I find it, it is interesting how it was a snowballing effect, and I, I quite like the seeds. Which it's interesting because Kerr planted seeds, didn't he? He had you there with a teaspoon and a brick wall saying punch through that brick wall he goes down to the idr uh, sony red guys and says right we're pushing this because they've also got the retail from as well going you know you have those independent relationships we need this to go gold we'll fly you out to amsterdam this is going to be a thing how did the band respond did they know that they were the golden goose and they were they were going to be that they were going to be the flagship band by design is that is that a disingenuous way of looking at it? Uh, look, they they certainly knew they were the guys, you mm-hmm. know, and that maybe not at first, um, and they certainly they are very much who they are. Uh, there is certainly no false pretenses with those guys. So, in other words, is what you see is what you get from them. Meaning is that they were never going to walk around. Um, what's the saying, the cock of the walk, you know, they were never going to be walk around saying, you know, who we're the ship because that's mm-hmm. not who they are, but they certainly knew that, you know, I mean, look, and you could look and you could see that we had our big metal bands. Um, and you could also always argue that for the longest time, Sepultura never relinquished a certain crown too, um, especially when they got, you know, they had the first major label partnership with Epic for Chaos AD. So, I mean, that was also very, very exciting and because of the ties with, with Sharon Osbourne and stuff like that. So it's, I think they knew, mm-hmm. um, you know, and we certainly, we were, look, I mean, obviously it was great. The band was, was uh, getting bigger and bigger and they certainly wanted it. You know, it's not like they were like, you know, they, 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 you know, once Peter committed, <laughs> and again, as, as we all know, you know, Peter at first didn't want to quit his day job. Um, but once, once he committed, it was like, okay, this needs to happen. Mm. Um, you know, cause I mean, that's look, you no know, half ass in it. Um, Taking a step back, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, could any other label of the time have known how to deal with typo like Rona, Roadrunner did? I know you're biased, and I know the answer is no. But I think this is this I, thing, isn't it? I, I agree, though, because um, Metal Blade wasn't set for the commercial radio stuff. Earache wasn't set, and they didn't have the u.s backing yet you know eventually they cut that deal with columbia but they weren't set yet Mm -hmm. um and so uh the other ones with century media um you know uh, nuclear blast these guys were not doing like they weren't set for the mainstream success um and then if you look at the majors I again, I don't think that they would have stuck with it. I mm-hmm. think that they, you know, even if you look at something like I mentioned, Corn, you know, who were groundbreaking, you know, as big and as mainstream as you may look at them now, Corn, you know, who 
I back to my last breath as well, um, as groundbreaking as they were, there still there is a certain uh, accessibility to them. You yeah. know, as heavy as it was, it was a groove, it was song based. That's the thing. With Typo, you're talking about a band. That's the different thing. And that's where I think the, the big mainstream entities would have had a hard time uh, committing to something as bizarre as this because that's the big thing is the song thing. Um, mm-hmm. Corn would write heavy but four amazingly minute. groove-ridden uh, four-minute songs with a hook. Um, typo would write nine to 11 minute long epic sonic journeys. Um, that's not radio. Yeah. <laughs> that's not an easy thing to sell. And, and the edits, horrible, <laughs> because they couldn't not be. Lose How essence. do you take a nine minute long song, make it four minutes, and have it not be an incomplete thought fragment? Yeah. Um, we did the best we could, and obviously there was great success with it, but it was like, yeah, so I, yeah, I'm biased, but no, no one else could have done it. Yeah, it's 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 a beast unto it. So when I maybe it's just the way that people learn to communicate. So after the fact, right? When I, when I'm showing typo to people who aren't really into metal, I call it sex metal because it is kind of like it occupies that. It's it. It's not. To, I can see why people would object to it in a, in a not object to it, but like I can see why the majors would take objection to maybe pushing it as far as Roadrunner did, simply because it's somewhat taboo. The subject matter is a little bit more um, crass than maybe what they're used to, even in an underground sense. Um, but that's kind of the appeal. I can see why it resonated with yourself, and it's the same reason it resonated with me. The first one, I, the first typo record I bought was uh, Dead Again. Um, in 2007 and I saw him at Wacken that year and it wasn't until I started this project where I was like let's go back and see what the fuss was all about and then it just fucking kicks me right in the teeth maybe it's just like there's like an age cynicism with myself as I've sort of moved out of my 20s which it maybe it got its hooks in or something like that um so the goes gold Alan Becker decides he doesn't want to fly over to Amsterdam but he sends his, his minions to go over for the party, but not not to interrupt. But you know, you, mm. you said something though uh, that also I think is important. Sure. In that you know, you talk about the content matter and being whatever taboo or whatever. Case definitely uh, was certainly not afraid of controversial subject matter um he he enjoyed a certain amount of controversial subject matter um you could easily look through our catalog and see th- times where we we tapped into that um and so the idea of going with something controversial whether it be sex or a severed head on a brujeria record mm-hmm. or stuff like that um you know and absolutely is something that case would would get a big grin about he liked a certain amount of that so uh yes there are certainly some people that would and and i know 2021 everyone's afraid of anything controversial Mm -hmm. but we would lean into it absolutely so (laughs) have you heard the apple knockers flop house story uh i have not i will send you that this is case Please in do. 1965 or 1969 this is like this is perhaps the genesis of his um understanding that controversial is good um so how is he I, I was i was uh present at a dinner uh where there were three of us that went to a hooters uh as he was considering opening up one uh, and uh, so he, uh, he, I, and someone else went to went to Hooters for dinner to go and experience the the whole thing. Um, not obviously, not much came of that. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, how are you celebrating the record going gold? Then, so the sound scan um, details come in. In case everyone gather around, we finally hit the milestone. Alan Becker's minions are off getting shit faced in Amsterdam. Um, <laughs> How are you? How are you celebrating? Well, we had the uh, uh, the 
celebration in Brooklyn uh, with mm -hmm. the band, of course. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the infamous that plaque picture was uh, uh, Italian restaurant in South Brooklyn. <laughs> um, was it Christmas time or was it they just have that kind of decoration up? Uh, just that kind of decoration. <laughs> <laughs> it's welcome to fucking Brooklyn. <laughs> um, you know, I don't remember any. I mean, it was it was wonderful, and it's funny. Like I remember that day vividly. Um, you know, you could see in that picture. You know, well, it looks like I just left the gym. Uh, it's because I literally was like so, like the the girl who was who was our press person was like, uh, Mark, you think you can breathe? Maybe I was like, no. Nope. I like literally was like so proud of that moment. It was like this fulfilling uh, destiny thing, but it was just what we did. I mean, that was you know at that point I had long since considered myself to be the fifth negative, um, <laughs> you know, and it was just. Uh, amazing, but um, yeah. I don't remember any specific thing. <laughs> let's let's sort of unpack the where the label was there for at. So this is the milestone yeah. moment. This is where if Case hadn't if Case wasn't considering the prospect of a metal label viable at that point, he certainly fucking was once he got the gold record. Um, right. So I, I can't remember who told me this, but his his, his ultimate objective was to get the platinum, was to do it in that that territory of the United States. Just to sort of hit home the gravity of the gold and the first yeah. gold for Roadrunner, what is so important about the United States as a market compared to the rest of the world? Maybe it's some, not something you can quite comment on because you're a U.S. operation and you yourself, you're a U.S. colleague. But why was that important to Case? Because Roadrunner had, had gold by that point just through different channels in, say, the Netherlands, the Benelux area and things like that. You can't deny the importance of the American market on the musical uh, uh, sphere. Mm. You know, it, it's such a huge market. It's obviously economically, but also it's, you know, there are, there's so much uh, to the U.S. of being, you know, the, it's like the hub. Um, mm. I mean, yeah, you could easily look at, I don't mean to, I mean, you, you can certainly look at certain places around the globe that have been, um, you know, birthplaces of earth shifting, you know, musical things. You could, Birmingham, England, I mean, I don't need to explain the importance of Birmingham, England. Liverpool, England, another one, I, I don't need to explain. So there are certain things, Seattle, you know, mm. you could look at certain uh uh, things that come out of certain areas, but overall, you can't deny the importance of the the scope of the U.S. market, um, and the I importance guess... of us getting that gold record was, and it was beyond just money. I mean, it was of course it's money, but it's beyond just that bit of profit. It legitimized us as a label on the mainstream playing field. It allowed us to be taken seriously with all the majors because at the time, independent labels were not allowed to play in the same playing field as the majors. And this allowed us to play in that game. That's the fucking soundbite. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I'm a promo guy. <laughs> uh, hey, yeah. And it's so important to you because this is something I, that people will be sick of hearing. Well, my 10 listeners will be sick of hearing me saying, but this is why Rodron is so important. It was a disruptive force. And in the yeah. space of innovation, technologically, culturally, socially, the, the, the word disruption is the big word. And that's what's rock and roll. It's, it's a positive disruption. And when we take Simon Cowell trying to put his foot in the door with shit TV shows and making money through an out more algorithmic, certain um market trajectory it's really fun to see nine nut jobs in jumpsuits selling platinum records and disrupting that because that's really important and we could have other conversations about the trajectory of road and imagine if everything they did was platinum it maybe metal wouldn't be so special and the other side of that would be no you drive weird as shit underground and the the, the, the culture propagates itself in that way but that's the thing, isn't it? That's why Roadrunner is so special because it was a vehicle of disruption for the wider status quo. 
And that's why we need to learn and unpack and reverse engineer how Case did it and how you did it, how Monty did it, so we can better learn how to administrate the metal of today. Well, here's the thing. You have to also remember is that Slipknot, as earth shift as they are, and they are, period, end of story, uh, haters fuck off. Um, not that there really are any anyway, but Slipknot was the culmination of or, or whatever the uh the payoff of years of exactly what you're saying and meaning is that look at the successful run and this is the thing there's a reason why okay slipknot now are slipknot but there was a time when slipknot also wanted to be on the roadrunner red brand mm -hmm. They wanted that because when you look at, I mean, look at what was happening when you've got your obituary who, you know, at the time, I mean, it was like, you know, here was this crazy band, uh, this death metal thing where the singer wasn't even using words and it, and the, the roar that came out of John Tardy's mouth, it was like, it was, you know, there's your disruptive. So you got your obituary, you got your, your machine head, you got your fear factory. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you've got, uh, well, obviously Sepultura at this point are now, it's like they're less jarring because they're bigger. Uh, okay. It's like, look at, at, at all these, you know, these bands that are, you know, and then, and again, and there's a whole wave of legendary metal bands uh, Malevolent Creation, not as big, but Malevolent Creation, uh, Sadis, um, mm -hmm. who I, I mean, gave us Steve DiGiorgio, one of the greatest yeah. people to ever pick up a bass in the metal world. Um, you know, there was a wave of metal, and of course, as I said earlier, two of the greatest records that Roadrunner ever put out, which I don't care, and and he will, Kyle will not say this because Kyle is a good man, and I back him, and so I'll say this without exhorter, we don't have Pantera in the form that everyone worships them. Kyle avoids this with a one mile pole because he's he's a good man, he doesn't need that hassle. Yep, I'm saying it, not Kyle. <laughs> 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 um, just, just yeah, to... so so Slipknot is what comes from years of putting out these amazing successful metal bands that brings and then Monty finds now again I'm not it's like so that that allowed us to be like dude because who knows whether Slipknot would have signed with us or someone else if um you know if we didn't have all that was Slipknot, um, and, uh, oh, DSI, another one. I mean, again, yes. you could sit there, you could find all these bands. So the great now, Slipknot were a force of nature, or are a force of nature. Slipknot are masters of their own success. That's not to take away Roadrunner's piece of that, but Slipknot came out and they hit the world like an atom bomb. Mm -hmm. um, and so... This is not to take away anyone's work, but mm. those guys are, are are owners of their success because they are just slipknot. Oh, totally. I mean, there could be an entire conversation about the culmination of attitudes, work, and understanding potential also was a prelude to seeing them and going, yes, as opposed to seeing them and going, not viable. Nine members? No way. This is too fringe. You know, there's they, they all work in sim um, in symbiosm. Symb is that word? Oh, thank yeah. God. It, it, what it is? <laughs> look, it's they got that Ozfest slot. Yeah, and that's why I, I give them credit for their own success. And again, that's not a diss on any of the coworkers at Roadrunner at all. I state that emphatically. But the point is, is they got that Ozfest slot, and there was nothing like them and they went out on that stage and they just it was like fuck you we're slipknot and it was like you pay attention to us and they came out there and they stole ozfest that year they stole freaking ozfest um and so that's why it's like so it's he came out and then that thing just and then yes the label had to do its part and again it's 
any of my coworkers hear this, this is not a diss on them. You just <laughs> cannot deny the force of nature that is like there, there are some there's some bands, and just to help you out, like with that. So there's some bands which were like, even if you stayed at home all day for a year, they would still be the like huge bands. One of them's Fair Factory. One of them's Slipknot. One of them's Nickelback. One of them's Trivium. Killswitch, yes. Um, there's a, just a few where it was like it was just they, the sheer amount of willpower and direction and drive, all falling into the right slots. It was always going to happen. The Nickelback thing is interesting, you know. And and again, and I I again, I'm one of the people that will defend them to uh, near violence. Uh, <laughs> those are good dudes whose mm-hmm. only crime is that they succeeded. Yep. Um, as much as people like to, to shit on Nickelback, uh, F you. Um, but here's what's done now. With Nick- D- Imagine Dragons are now that, that whoever occupied that platform to be shot on for success is now Imagine Dragons. And then people are now a little bit more nostalgic for Nickelback. But yes, continue. Right. Nickelback was interesting because um, the first record, well, that we had, the first record... Um, well, that was a, a two-year-long slog, um, and it was not – it wasn't the gold record. Uh, it was not a breakthrough success. Mm-hmm. It was – and those guys worked their fucking asses off. We dragged them to every radio station in America to do interviews and meet and greets and acoustic uh, events on the air. Mm-hmm. Um, those guys worked their – fucking asses off and they and, and absolutely no question about it now that being said is so so it wasn't a slam dunk mm-hmm. however the next record chad who is an amazing songwriter gave us uh, 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 the like a song, the likes of which I have seen very rarely in my career. Um, that was a hit off the scale. Uh, How you remind me was holy shit, big. Um, and yeah, okay. At that point, you know, as I like to put in perspective to people, I go. Um, a lot of people don't necessarily remember the day that Silver Side Up came out. 9-11. 9 fucking 11. <laughs> I remember we had had a number one record. It was huge on radio, the whole buildup. And, and this happens. And I remember saying one of the things that I said that week was like, okay, this record is going to sell 42 copies. I'm like, no one's going to the stores to go buy a record. America just got attacked. This is horrible. This is like, you know, uh, it's like no one's going to buy this record because no one's going to go buy any record. And people went out and it was, you know, with a it, this massive opening week sales that week. And I went, really? I'm like, I'm like, you, we just got attacked as a nation with this horrific terrorist attack. And you still feel the need to go buy this record? I'm like, that's a statement. So yeah. it was, yeah, it's, and yeah, the Nickelback were, you know, one of the biggest rock bands on the planet. And that was uh, a gift to be able to work with those guys. And they mm-hmm. are some of the nicest guys on the planet, uh, who, again, whose only crime is that they succeeded. Yeah. Yeah. We can unpack a lot more about that. Yeah, but we have yeah. skipped over a bit, and it's, it's yeah, yeah. It's a, we're wow. we're pinballing. Oh, I love know. it. I love it. This is this. I live for this shit. This is so good. Yeah. <laughs> I was gonna say, you thought your biggest problem on nine eleven was coming out the same day as the new Slayer record. <laughs> no, honestly, <laughs> that's not the case. <laughs> right? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, All right. Let's let's bounce back to nineteen ninety one. Yeah. So you, you you're in the role. You're yes. doing the thing. You're 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 <laughs> interfacing with the thrash and the death. But there it becomes yeah. there comes. There's two things I consider to be a bit of a catalyst for the label at this time. One, Case instructs Monty, yourself, someone, he communicates in some way saying, we need to move away from thrash and death. We need to expand. And then there's a second thing that happens, which is sound scan. And I think those two things, like in, in unison, created a market of alternative music, which is where Roadrunner sort of 
state its claim or tried to for the next sort of nearly 10 years. How did you feel about that as as a heavy dude, like as a guy who's, you know, looking at what ear is putting out and, uh, you know, having a, a stake in the cannibal corpse story, were you thinking, fuck, we don't want to get involved in this fucking, in this plaid shirt shit? It, it was okay because first off, like I said, is, you know, the Emergo thing, pre-existed me you know i mean it was like the emergo thing you know you, so there were, even when i walked in the door uh in the little independent label seven people in a room that we were all sharing one computer um yes that's the the stone age that we existed in uh you had to sign up for computer time but anyway, <laughs> <laughs> you kids i used to walk up hill five now anyway <laughs> um <laughs> the point is is that um so there was always a certain flavor of that there. And right. there was always, when you look through, you know, so there was always stuff, whether it be, um, you know, a doggy dog, a black train Jack, uh, the third mind stuff, which was really, you know, very different. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so there was, there was always these attempts. And I think that my attitude was always like, but whatever you go play around with that shit we got the 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 meat and potatoes here is the metal stuff because that was obviously what we were mm -hmm. and so uh and there was so much awesomeness you know i think it's funny i i always i have to go back and remember like i mean in 92 we had the biohazard record i was trying to remember yes. the year you know that was another one where we were attempting I mean, it was all this stuff biohazard grunt truck um along with your fear factories, your obituaries. Um, so we had all these different flavors of metal that this other stuff was like a little side dish. And because of, okay, we need it for me and who I was, Psycho from Roadrunner, I was the guy, I was the metal brand, whatever. So the thing is, is they would get, they would bring in another radio person to do that stuff because and so yeah you could easily say that i was pigeonholed okay i was happily pigeonholed you know uh for the longest time you know i, I didn't i never really cared about wanting to be a part of that other stuff and they could if we were growing enough they could hire someone else and there were uh there were all the modern rock or alternative promo people over the years um, there was a Carolyn Wolf. There was a Tom Gates. Um, there were these people that came in and, and great. I mean, I was thrilled to work side by side with them. Uh, I've got nothing but amazing things to say about every single one of them. And I was also happy that they were there to work that shit. <laughs> Is there you say, what did I think? Well, you go work that shit. <laughs> and that was, it was all good. I was the it, master of the metal world. <laughs> yeah. The king of your own domain. So exactly. where yes. Do am I putting too much credence in SoundScan for affecting the output? SoundScan changed the whole business. Um, you know, but I think the reason it helped us is because I think the world got to see how how much validity metal had. Mm. Um, you know, I mean, some of these bands I got to now walk around and and show people, oh, you think this stuff is stupid little underground shit? Well, look how big it is, mm -hmm. you know? And so that's the way I always looked at it because my whole sales pitch was always these bands are doing stuff to a level that the that these radio bands are not doing and you're not giving them credibility. Like, for example, is, is there was the time when I tried to take Sepultura to commercial radio, um, you know, with a non-English speaking song, Rada Mahata, because uh, it was like the most like groove based or whatever. Yep. And, and no, it didn't really work, but I got some airplay. But the point is, is I got to walk around to people and say, look, you're playing radio band X who's selling 42 copies. Well, look at Sepultura who are selling hundreds of thousands of copies. And so it, it allowed us the proof to say, look at what's real. Look at yeah. what's really happening on the street. You can't deny your listeners what's happening on the street. So it's I looked at it as something that helped us. It's, um, it's, it's interesting. So when Roadrunner started in 81, 
It was on the strength of Bertus distribution in the Benelux area. And it was all... The, the the vibe was essentially everything was tipped off to case it was like by a guy called i think it was dirk van hoofel i think his name was if i remember my research from um, three or four months ago and he's the guy that would say to jan van der linden in case right lads we've got a lot of imports for this band fucking battle axe you should be selling that that's where it is and it's interesting because that's the spark Nielsen comes in and validates the spark and the gold record is the ribbon that makes it go, yeah, this is a totally... That's the trajectory, that's the story arc of metal in Roadrunner being an appropriate vehicle for success. That's just sort of like in my head. That's that's how the story sort of pulls together. Um, Okay, so as we move into sort of the latter part of that decade, Mm -hmm. I read somewhere that 96 and 97 were regarded as tough years. So we're now moving into, we're, we're well into, <laughs> you've seen what comes out in 96. I'll, I can help you out a little bit. <laughs> I'll tell you, you know, look, here's the thing. You go back to the beginning of this conversation. You talk about, you know, the psycho thing. Yeah. Um, everything that happened in college was the opening act for me. You know, I was <laughs> let loose when I came back to New York and then got into, you know, the New York industry and uh you know expense accounts and and just and and us all fueling each other yeah dude i i was out of control so i remember so much but you want me to talk about specific years and stuff that's why i print this shit out because (laughs) it's like it gets it does get a little fuzzy in there about which is which Mm -hmm. uh i burned some brain cells but yeah yeah yeah. yeah, go ahead well it's the last part of that decade is what i'm saying so we're talking like post bloody kisses pre um slipknot there's this gap which is not necessarily blurry we've got the flagship acts that are still churning out the fucking goods but there's still this expansion that's trying to happen and it, i don't think it necessarily takes um and i'm wondering if that's where this sort of uncertainty was coming from because i don't regard this as like if you look down back maybe it's hindsight but it doesn't feel like a bad period it doesn't feel like a period of uncertainty it just feels like growing pains if anything. Absolutely. You know, it was, I mean, there was a lot of cool stuff that we put out. Uh, A lot of cool things we tried. Um, You know, there was a whole journey we tried with, uh, and again, it's, and as I I look back to to get my years, you know, you're right. Because when you look at like 94 to 96, that's when you started to have things, you know, you had, um, uh, okay, that's when Black Train Jack and Dog Eat Dog hit, but that's also, okay, you also had Die Monster Die, which was yes. a big attempt for us at Modern Rock, but also that's when we had a little bit more of the, the uh, a rootsy AAA thing with Kevin Salem and Blue Mountain. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, there was, again, and there was always these tries, again, when you go back years before, when you look at the last crack thing, you know, there was always these projects that we were trying Um and this goes back to what I was saying about Case being a businessman in that, you know, he wasn't pigeonholed in that I need to be only metal. No, 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 no. He wanted a successful music label. Um, all good. You know, God, God bless him. You know what? Without that drive and without that desire, we wouldn't be talking today. Uh, exactly, but yeah. so he was always trying different things. Um I mean, and and then you look through this stuff, but yeah, when you, but we were still on a tear with the stuff that kept us fueled. Because again, you can pull out all these records that happened and then Frontline Assembly was in 94, you know, and that was a great record. Although to mm-hmm. me, that, that seemed Roadrunner anyway, even though it was more techno, it was like, it was so aggressive, um, yeah. you know, but it's like any, you look and we're still doing the third mind stuff. Um, you know, the moon seven times came out, so you, but that was not new. I mean, we were still doing all that, uh, kind of, you know, that electronic, you know, alt, alt stuff, mm-hmm. um, you know, but 95, you look at me, 95, you had D manufacture. Um, so and you can't, 
overstate the importance of that record. You know, as, as great as Soul of a New Machine is, obviously Demanufacture was a holy shit record from Fear Factory. No, it wasn't the gold record that happened with um, with Obsolete. That was the Cars cover. Um, but yeah. Demanufacture is what put them on the map, and that's still going to be her heralded as a legendary metal record. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we're still coming off of uh, Machine Head just starting. Um, you know, I mean, and, and with the, the initial burn my eyes. So you're, you're talking about, I mean, obituary at this point are getting a little long in the tooth, but Life of Agony are just starting. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, that's 94, 95. So there's always... You know, we had something each year, um, and but yeah, okay, you can look and see, and, and you're right, when you brought up that point about was this a, a tough stretch, you're right, there weren't that many big records, but there were records each year mm -hmm. that when you look back, the Roadrunner fans look back on fondly and say, yeah. Um, I guess you got to think know, of it as a like, working yeah. day, right? So, like, if you take all your working hours within those years, I guess then you can have some nostalgia for the early nineties. When there, then something gets hit out of the park, it's like it's it's the catharsis of all that work. When you have the flagship flagship acts that are carrying through the latter part of that decade, it's kind of business as usual, and anything else is an admin overhead. I guess. Mm -hmm. So maybe when people think back on that, or maybe I don't want to speak for people, but there are, I'm sure you're about to allude to some which didn't quite make it through. So for example, um, Ratos de Parau, which is, I believe it's, it was a Brazilian, I think that was Roadrunner Brazil for a bit, which brought in a lot, which didn't go very far, I don't believe. Garage for yeah. Screaming Mother, loads of like ones that we don't hear about these days. Which R made. RDP, man. I, I loved RDP, but look, there's no question. RDP is, is about as simple to understand as it gets. Sepultura. <laughs> um, meaning, Sepultura brought them to Monty and mm -hmm. said, these are our buddies. You should give this thing a try. Um, it's a fucking great record. Mm. I still go back and listen to that record. Those, those two records that we put out to this day, yeah. they're great records. Now, right, did they, did they blow wide open? That's, but you know what? That's the thing about labels are is that you go into each thing with different expectations. Yes. And you spend accordingly. Um, so, so, for example, is you don't spend on an RDP like you're going to spend on um, a Sepultura. You know, yeah, sure. yeah, they're both from Brazil. Yeah, they're both aggressive, but one's going to get the a level budget and one's going to get the c level budget this is the true this is like the the, the dark art of a and r though isn't it because yeah. as provocative as brujeria is you do understand that it's an underground record by design and therefore it's its potency is usually in in the packaging and is it's not going to go too far because well I, I, that's that's disingenuous. It went far in that in that what it is is done really well. However, you're not going to push it like typo or negative because you're going to hit a lot of roadblocks on the way, usually pertaining to the front, uh, the album cover, the rotating members. It's not quite got the same product viability as, say, a Sabotero or a typo or negative. And again, that's the dark art of A&R, trying to spot those things and understand, well, what's the number? How many hours are we going to put Mark on this? Breweria was fun and a pain in the ass because <laughs> I loved working it because we had to sell that story. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is the story was not the true story. Meaning right. is that in the beginning, they were Mexican criminals. We were not allowed to say who was in the band. <laughs> we had to sell the fact that Monty was thrown into the back of a car with a bag over his head, taken to an undisclosed location, forced to sign the deal. Like it was a whole press release. It was like we were selling the story. We were selling the shenanigans yeah. and that was fun but you wanted so badly to be like dude you should care because look who's in this fucking band <laughs> mm, mm. couldn't say now we know who's been in the band whether it be dino or you know uh chain or whatever it's like but it's 
it's at the time. So that was fun, but it was a pain in the ass because you really wanted to just be like, dude, you got a, <laughs> you got a thing here. Yeah, I didn't know that it was like everyone was anonymous back in the day. First record, everyone's anonymous. Wow. <laughs> I know they had, they had the, the, the aliases, but I didn't know it was like, I didn't know you couldn't find out who they were unless you really tried. W- word got out, but yeah, yeah, you had to work for it. <laughs> Do you remember a band that's escaping me now in terms of a name? Shit, what was it? Toy Shop. I didn't work it, but I do remember it. Again, it was like they didn't really have me work too much of the super alt stuff. Um, I didn't expect you would. Well, it was interesting because there was a point around – it was around 97 when I left – the, um, mm-hmm. And then I left for three years and then they put someone else in my chair, a guy named Joe, friend of mine. Um, he was a little bit less pigeonholed. And again, that's, you know, that's more of a shot at me than anything else. But yeah. That's OK. I'm, <laughs> I ain't apologizing for nothing. Um, <laughs> and so and then when I came back. You know, so he did some a little bit more of the uh, the gray area stuff, mm. and then it was funny because then when I came back three years later, it was funny. I uh, the job that I had left, I still remember it was I was at TVT working with Seven Dust, right. um, and there was a demo that was floating around the business, um, and we amongst everyone else got it, and it was what I called a bush ripoff band um and that of course was was nickelback and i was like dude we should totally sign this this is great they sound like bush mm. um and it, it turns out that no one was going to sign them but roadrunner because dave lonko uh really had the inside track on that and so i was able to come back for the setup of the first single leader of men yep. for nickelback um and so and then obviously that just changed everything because from there on, not only did Nickelback change the label and take over everything between Nickelback and Slipknot, but then that also started us in beyond, I mean, not viability, but beyond success in the mainstream rock world. We got Theory of a Dead Man from that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it was like, and on and on and on and on. Um, and so I really... It's like I was always kind of left out of the alternative thing. The problem problem was that I didn't care because I was mm. so happy. I, w- I had already succeeded in my dreams and my goals and was continuing to. Yeah. Yeah. That was all good. <laughs> I mentioned um, Toy Shop specifically because there's some weird, yeah. there's some strange story around that. And I'm trying to unpack it. it it's, I think it's something like one particular territory really pushed toy shop and it was like a south american singer and they ended up on like shampoo bottles and stuff and this is a roadrunner act i know it's crazy but i need to figure it out I, I, i'm gonna tap out of that one <laughs> cool, you mentioned a name which i wanted to unpack a little bit because it's not come across my desk a lot until i started like looking into the trades and that's uh dave long Cow. is a uh, dave long cow how you pronounce it L- L- lonco Lonco. Dave, okay. Dave Lonco. Um, what's his story? It, is he is? Yeah. What's what's the what's the deal there? Because it seems like his introduction to the label gave it a lot of credibility. That's what I feel like I'm reading, but I don't know his backstory. Absolutely. You know, it's Case was always trying to bring in a a big gun. For the our, our first uh, the radio world, um, that was going to be my boss. It was going to be someone that you know coming in with all this experience. And I was in. It's funny. I was in this weird little because again, it, it's my story does flow in with that, or at least mm-hmm. from my perspective of it, um, because it also it led to my leaving, um, and that was. I was this weird little contradiction of cocky little shit who definitely was thinking who he was, who he was, uh, after I was having all this success, but 
thankfully I was also smart enough to know that I could only self teach myself so much. So yeah. I wanted someone to teach me. Now, the problem is, is that case tried several times to bring these people in and they were a series of stumbles. How's that for a nice way of putting it? Mm-hmm. Um, these people didn't work out. It's part of my cockiness was that I, I kept outlasting these people they brought in as my boss. <laughs> anyway, uh, the point is, is so I was, I was both uh, happy yet frustrated and looking for, looking for more to grow me and my career. Mm-hmm. And I wound up finding uh, one of the more important people in my career, not Roadrunner, but my career was this woman named Valerie DeLong. She worked for uh, a company called The Enclave, which was uh, run by Tom Zutat, the a r guy who uh, gave us uh, Guns N' Roses and Motley Crue. Um, great, 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 great guy. Uh, I worked there for a little while. She was amazing, helped change my life, sat me down and said, listen, kid, you're good, but you're not that good. I'm going to help you. And she did. But the point is, so then I went from there. Then we shut down, and that's when I went to TVT. Uh, TVT was great. Got to work with Seven Dust. The guy who owns TVT was uh, legendarily um, problematic. (laughs) How's that for a nice way of putting Steve Gottlieb was a pain in the ass. Um, I was trying to get out of there for a while, and I was interviewing at any job that opened up because I wanted out. Um, as much as I loved working with Seven Dust, uh, that label was, I, I was not happy. And at one point I did interview for Dave over at RCA. Um, right. And Dave's a, Dave's just a good man. I mean, not only is he insanely experienced and insanely successful, but he's also a good guy. I mean, he was like, you know, no, no, no one uh, rejected me from a job in a nicer way than him. Um, Anyway, so the thing is, is that I wanted to work for him and I had tried to get a job from at RCA and he even wrote me this really nice letter saying like, I would hire you in a second, but I have to do this internal promotion if my people don't feel they can grow. And it was like really a personal touch of like, Mike, it left me with this. I'd, I'd like to work for this guy. He's obviously a good man. Mm-hmm. Um, he got the job. Uh, he was brought in uh, over there at Roadrunner and he is he's he's incredibly experienced incredibly successful his his story is 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 long um and then it turns out when joe was looking to go to columbia records Mm -hmm. to go get a great opportunity for him it was funny he had called me because my goal it's funny my goal had always been that i was going to i was always going to go back to roadrunner I had this whole vision. I had the whole thing laid out. I was going to go back as the guy in the big chair. Mm -hmm. That was my goal. I was like, I'm going to go back and I'm going to run the thing. Uh, And then, but Joe calls me up. He goes, hey, I'm leaving. Would you ever think about going back? Uh, And I went, absolutely. I said, I I planned on it. Um, And uh, so he, you know, he he said, no one knows this yet, but I'm leaving. He goes, and so I reached out to Dave um, we connected long story, a little bit less long, um, mm-hmm. cause it's too late to be a short story <laughs> is I want to, I, you know, it's, I was like, I want to work for this guy. Mm-hmm. And so I took, we, I, I convinced them to bring me back. Mm-hmm. Um, and I came in and we were, I mean, we were an amazing team. Um, a big part of it is, is that he's the right guy. Uh, he certainly embraced me in, in the proper position, meaning of me as his, his guy underneath him. And I definitely embraced him as the guy on top. And then you look at what we did. You know, it's like any any question about whether or not the guy was worth working for, or worth respecting, whatever. You look at what we did with Nickelback, yeah. and it was like, sold. I'm in. <laughs> Dave, you're a good man. <laughs> um, and, and and he is. It's and our friendship continues to this day. He's he's a great man. What's he doing now? Um. I actually haven't spoken to him in a little bit, but uh, he he joined the Nickelback management team. Oh, um, wow. 
Okay. Yeah. I mean, it was, uh, uh, you know, he wound up first. He retired for a little while, but I think what you find for a lot of us people is, you know, retirement is, is tough for some people. Um, yeah. Especially in this industry. So I, I think the retirement thing was temporary, um, but he was always tight with Chad, mm-hmm. uh, always. And so that that was about the least surprising thing that I ever saw happen was <laughs> the, uh, the Nickelback management team. When you initially left, so obviously yeah. you kind of you're wearing your heart on your sleeve all the time, going, "I need to learn somewhere and then come back." How's Case responding to this? Is he like, "Yeah, little shit." Or is he like, fair enough, go, grow, and I'll see you in five years, or however long it was? You know, it's interesting. Um, I haven't seen Case be, you know, he, he's a, he's, he doesn't get overly emotional with people. Um, and I don't mean that in any negative way. Just, mm-hmm. You know, if you, if you talk to him, if you know him, that's just kind of who he is. Um, I know he always loved me. Um, loves. I mean, he still does. He's still here. He was just, it's like all good. Um, <laughs> it, it, it was an interesting parting of ways because he wasn't happy about it. He did try and get me to stay, but I also told him that I it, it was something I had to do. Um, we certainly left on emotional but good terms. Um, and so I made sure to leave so that the door was still open. Mm-hmm. Um, it wasn't clearly stated, Hey, I'm going to come back, but I definitely left it in absolutely good terms so yeah. that when it came down to it, um, you know, it's actually, it's funny. You sit there, you say it's, uh, it wasn't so much the leaving. He was actually an important part of me not fucking up the return. Um, so funny. I put too much emotion. You talk about all this Roadrunner stuff. I put too much emotion. You talk about the heart and the sleeve. I put too much into it because I was at, here I am. I just told you how I was miserable at TVT. Yeah. I was trying to interview every single job that, that opened up. I got to get out. Mm-hmm. And I told you about my goals, about the whole, it's like, I overthought the crap out of this. So what happened was, is I had reached out to Dave and said, and I, and I said, Hey, let, let's talk. I hear you're going to have an opening. Let's talk. And he goes, okay. We went out to dinner, he and I, and he was like, so, and I, and I was dancing around it. And it was like, he's like, so why, why are we doing, why are we sitting here? Why are we talking? I said, I don't know, dude. I said, I need to feel if this feels right. Like I didn't even come in for the clothes. It was like I just kind of is. You know, hey, we're we're courting, you know. Look, mate, you and, ate pizza with a knife and fork. This isn't going to fucking work. And, and and the thing is, it's funny because I they then come back and everyone assumed that this was the was it a fait accompli. So they make an offer. It was all just kind of like talking, like hey, 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 here you go. You should come back. And I, of course put way, 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 way too much emotional baggage on this. And I put myself into an emotional little uh, traffic jam where I basically said I I wasn't convinced yet that it was the right time. Uh, And so I actually, I actually said no. Um, (laughs) Because obviously if it didn't feel right, obviously it was wrong. Sure. So I had accepted uh, a new, uh, new like I accepted to stay at TVT, <laughs> and then uh, they called. First off, Jonas, uh, who again, when I started, seven people in a room. Jonas Knoxon, who's a name you've heard, he was the marketing guy. So he like we we go back to like you know um, we. He and I actually, our first interaction was actually when I was in Buffalo at College Radio, but that's a whole right. other thing. Um, <laughs> Where, where he had to explain to me that King Diamond wasn't going to actually give me the prize that I had won at College Radio. Uh, but that's the thing. <laughs> I want to hear everything. I'm going to say, let's save that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so he calls me up and he's like, what the hell, dude? And again, it was like, and he basically goes, I'm calling up to reject your no, which is what I was like. Oh. But the thing is that I'm sitting here and I was just like, now I'm sitting there like I'm a mess. <laughs> and, 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 and Case wound up 
reaching out to me and being like, Mark, what are you, what are you doing? Come back. Come back. <laughs> uh, and then it was like, okay, jackass, <laughs> what are you doing? I'm like, this is what you want. What's wrong with you? Um, and so obviously I came back. And, you know, it was, um, yeah, I was in college radio. My, my, they did a contest where King Diamond was supposed to go to, was it uh, the Universal Studios or something like that and go along with like the, the, the tour? I don't remember which record it was. It was whether it was Abigail or them or whatever it was, whichever. Mm. Does it matter? No. Um, but my and it was like and it was a whole big thing and my it was like the if you ran the state the contest on your station and if your winner your listener won then the listener and a guest and the DJ and a guest got to go do this it was a big big contest mm. um, and uh, I think I don't think that anyone actually got him to sign off on it king um okay. i'm not 100 percent on that part so i will not go in writing on that but all i know is is that um kathy had to pass this off to her marketing guy jonas who then calls me uh the uh <laughs> poor college kid who is living with the bass player of cannibal corpse who was uh you know scraping on uh our the res the beer can from our parties to buy food for each week so then they call <laughs> up and said uh so listen uh, uh here we're gonna write you a check for like 500 bucks uh and the winner and like like is that okay now it's and it's funny and i'm like i'm like i scored big Woo-hoo! now it, and it's, of course roadrunner got off easy because sure. they saved sold this money um and I still, and it was funny. So I got, I wound up getting a job and Jonas would for years be like, I want my money back. <laughs> <I'm> like, no. <laughs> so, yeah. So Jonas yeah. and I literally go back to before when I was in Buffalo, but I digress. <laughs> uh, yeah. No, it's a good story though. A new life form. <laughs> One thing I'm, I'm, I'm going to speak to a chap in a few days. Um, Ro uh, Cohill or Coley, Coley, sorry. Coley, yeah. yes. The impact, and this is like a marketing and promotional question, and we'll try, well, let's make it the last one because I think that this is something that is worth unpacking because it's very, it's got a very strong relationship with the UK branch of Roadrunner, the street team stuff. Do you know how the idea for the street team was incepted? Do you know how it kind of interplayed with the wider marketing stuff? Was this just case going, fuck it, yeah, throw anything at the wall, see what sticks? I know that was, that was Rose thing, wasn't it? It was the street team, it was marketing promotion, and he kind of like, he was kind of an innovator in that space. Or was it already in existence in a big way? Um, I don't think that we were the, no, okay. There's no way we were the first company to have a street team, but Mm. we absolutely used it to amazing effect. Um, now I think that there's, you know, there's, there's two parts to this, one of which, as I said before, you know, was we had these great bands with great bases. So when you're working, when you're, when you're starting off with great source material, (laughs) uh, great bands with great followings, um, then it's, it's easy to spread, you know, obviously look, I mean, we're, when you're spreading something good that already has a start then it's great. It's, Mm -hmm. it's easier to take a small fire and make it a bigger fire than to start with no fire and make a fire. Um, You know, so there's no question that we had that. That being said, Roe also was, is a beast. (laughs) Roe is a machine. Um, And, and you should definitely talk to him and I'm glad you are going to talk to him. He's amazing. And he, he absolutely, uh, he took that street team to a whole new level. Mm -hmm. Uh, because, you know, again, it goes back to a lot of what I was saying before. The people in that room bled Roadrunner Red. Um, you know, it, it's everyone took their passion for what we did and they put their heart and their soul into it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I just tell my perspective, my version of it. But Roe, for example, is another guy bleeding roadrunner red Mm -hmm. and he was great at uh you know marshalling that team 
growing that team um, and and the brand. I mean, it all plays into itself. People did want it. Look, everyone wanted to be a part of of Roadrunner Red. Everyone. And so it was like so. So when he go reaches out, you know, it's like he didn't have a lack of people wanting to be a part of it. He just had to make sure that he had good people and that he got them doing the right thing. Mm. Um, and so, and he was great at that. Uh, and he's now, he's got all this other businesses that he does on his own. He's doing great. Um, but that was definitely a big part of it. And again, because so much of what we did couldn't count on and couldn't get commercial radio airplay, which was such a big part of it. We Roadrunner was so much of, of a street entity, so yeah. much of, of a, uh, a reality based entity. And we were proof that you could survive and thrive as a metal label without just getting the mainstream commercial airplay, which honestly is a gamble anyway, because mm. it's expensive. And if it doesn't pay off, you're in the hole. Um, yeah. That's yeah. the nature of commercial radio, because it costs a lot of money to play in that game. And if it doesn't work. I so, guess this is the thing, right? So like, <clears throat> With it, with Rodona being the vehicle to commercialize fringe elements of music and put it in your face, what the, the, the biggest thing you could possibly, oh, the strongest marketing tool is word of mouth, I guess. And I, I guess what Rod did and what the street teams did was they militarized the word of mouth and they actually strategized around it. So, I mean, I, I say it has a really strong relationship with the UK and I, I think I, I'm trying to unpack the relationship Roadrunner has with the UK because it is something really potent. There was something really present about Roadrunner in the UK and I'm trying to figure out what it was and why it beat out everyone else. And at the minute, it's just a vibe because I lived it. But the, every time I came out of Leeds cockpit after a Roadrunner, even if it wasn't a Roadrunner gig, if it was any fucking gig, there was always some dudes there with the samplers, with the flyers, with the things. And it created some kind of, it made it more tangible. And I think something we need like a forensic psychologist on it to tell us that, oh yeah, having something tangible in your hand was way more potent as a marketing um, tool than hoping radio one isn't shitting on Mark Aberson that month. You know what I mean? It's, it, 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 you know, when you have music fans leaving, and that was the other thing is that when they were leaving a show and you stuck something, for example, stuck something in their hand for them to, to wake up the next morning and be like, oh yeah, um, mm. you know, whether it be a, you know, early days cassette or later on a CD or, or a flyer or something like that. Um, and it did get to be a point where eventually everyone was doing the street team thing. Everyone was doing that. And, and so you left a show and you were being assaulted with stuff, but you know, there was definitely a point where it was like, you know, and again, so that was a big part of what he was doing, mm. you know, and again, it's, you're talking about the timeline, you know, we, it, there was definitely a phase where not everyone was as aggressive and as effective as we were. And uh, it, it definitely, it, it absolutely helped to walk out, with something now you talk about the uk versus the us you also have to say we were a global entity you know yeah. we would have these uh meetings not, not so much me because my job was very u.s based i mean mm -hmm. u.s radio but the thing is but the marketing guys they would have international conversations and meetings and they would also so everything was you know communicated together so we would definitely share things and yes, some things would work better in other territories, mm -hmm. you know, as much as doggy dog will bitch and moan about how the US label sucked and, and didn't do shit for them. But yet overseas, they were playing arenas. There was also, it's like, there was, there comes a point where it, it didn't connect. Mm -hmm. um, but, and sorry, but, um, you know, so yeah. yeah, so, so there was a communication though, where we would share stuff across the pond speaking to the innovative side of that was there any other things that i might have missed in terms of how Rudder would push itself i know that i've seen quite a lot of, like there's some like advanced kind of promo moments like there's a chaos ad promo like film where there's some interviews and things like that was there anything else that I've, i'm missing the boat on I, I, I think the street team's a massive part of it and obviously the radio campaigns were also a huge part of it especially in the way we contextualize it in legitimizing the label 
I'm just wondering if I've missed anything. You know, so much of it was the blood, sweat, and the tears of this unique group of, of, of people. Um, right. and, and I give credit to the whole team because it's, I don't know, it's like we had great acts mm. that we worked our asses off for. And yes, we definitely, you know, we, we would create these cool promotional materials and we would definitely try and grab attention on different projects the best way we could. Um, you know, and, and if a, an artist handed you some kind of material that you could create some kind of cool promo off of, then we would absolutely lean into that. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, uh, it, it's, we were just, as I always say, success breeds success. Yeah. Um, and as we continued on a roll, it was easy to build on that success with not every act, but with a lot of our acts. Um, that is the nature of the business, is that when you're hot, people definitely tend to lean into you and give you more credibility, and give you more. It's like, look, when you're hot, you're hot. If you're cold, you're cold. That mm. stuff is definitely true. So I guess we, were, we, we were the shit in the metal world for a long ass time. I guess it's like, it's just reliability, isn't it? People are going to go back to the people who are reliable. I think that's a good way to end it for now. I think we should definitely do another one.